Hey, welcome everybody, um, wherever you are, in person here in Invermere, nice to see you all. And also um, up in Golden, I hope you can see and hear okay, and then and wherever, wherever you, you are, are online. online. Thank, you Thank you very, very much for joining, joining in church, church today. today. So we go so through we go our announcements before, before the service, service begins, begins, and, and uh, we often, yeah start with this frame that just uh, thanks everybody for your faithful financial support however you can give um, thank you for figuring that out and for your financial support and so next sunday on well father's day but anyway um, next sunday john butters is going to give the message john is a retired united church minister who lives in guelph ontario and john has spoken numerous times and so he's giving the message next Sunday, and then I'm going to be giving the message on June 25th. And then in July and August, essentially, we don't have church uh, because of my continuing education and uh, holidays. Um, but we will send out links that you can um, use if you'd like to to join other churches online. Um, it's that's a nice opportunity. However, on Sunday, July 23rd, I would like to have some in-person services on that Sunday, uh, Golden at 9.30 in the morning, Edgewater at 1 o'clock in the afternoon, and then Windermere in the evening at 7 p.m. So uh, really nice to um, use those churches and uh, uh, for us to go up, for Sally and I to go up to Golden in the morning and then have a service in Edgewater and at St. Peter's Church in Windermere. So next Sunday, there will be a communion service at 10 o'clock at the chapel here in Invermere at 10 o'clock. Celebrating 50 years of marriage, Ed and Barb Lysick, uh, this just past week on June 9th, celebrated their 50th anniversary. So that's super nice to see a picture that was taken that day. And uh, so there's Ed and Barbara. So um, congratulations to you too. We'd like to uh, mention and support the Mission and Service Fund of the United Church of Canada and the PWRDF Fund of the Anglican Church. Now, uh, this is a, a nice thing to be made aware of. Disability Without Poverty, an organization out of Vancouver, has been putting pressure on the government to raise the amount of monthly income that gets paid to people with diverse abilities. They have just had success by getting the bill to have a second reading and want to keep moving forward. After the service, you can ask Kate uh, more about this movement and their postcard campaign. So I don't see Kate in person yet, but maybe she'll come or maybe she's online. Every Friday morning from 10 to 11.30, uh, we have an online gathering, a time of listening to talks by Eckhart Tolle and a time for discussion. It is a meaningful and helpful spiritual time. Please let me know if you would like to receive the Zoom link. And we have a couple, two or three more Fridays, and then we'll take the summer off. Um, but it's a very good group and very, very helpful uh, information. So we have started... Well, let me just read this. Affirming ministry. A steering committee has been started in the church to look into what it would mean for us to become a proclaimed affirming ministry. The committee of 10 people has now met three times and is following the process that has been created through Affirm United. And we will be hosting a variety of opportunities for members of the congregation to join in exploring this process. Already, the BC Anglican Diocese and the Pacific Mountain United Church region are affirming, and we are exploring this intention for our local shared ministry, uh, which I, I think would include Golden. During the month of June and moving forward, our steering committee plans, our steering committee plans to provide some information during each church service. We're already welcoming, so why become affirming? When the question of becoming an affirming ministry arises, people may feel that they are already welcoming, so there is no reason to become affirming. The, the affirming ministry program acknowledges the hurt and injustice the church has caused 
to many social groups, not just to LGBTQ, IA two spirit plus people, but also to black indigenous and people of color in our racism and fear of those who are different from ourselves. And through our silencing or exclusion of people because of their class and economic background, their age, ability, culture, gender, and ethnicity, or their physical or mental health. The Affirming Ministry Program, while it focuses on issues of gender identity and sexual orientation, seeks to live into a vision of justice and inclusion for all God's people. Affirming Ministries believe it is important to be a public witness and to be a role model for other ministries. As a first initiative, we note that the Columbia Valley Pride community invites us to join and celebrate with them at Pothole Park this coming Saturday. And so here's like a little poster of that information. And uh, so Pride Festival, so Saturday, June 17th, 1 to 4 at Pothole Park in Invermere, BC, featuring all ages, live performances, local vendors, fun and games, community barbecue. So uh, I know Sally and I plan on being a part of uh, a good chunk of that. Uh, it's also highway cleanup in Fairmont, so we're going to do that as well, but we want to be a part of the Pride Festival too. So um, come on out, uh, folks, if you can. A creative writing workshop with Tanaha poet Smokey Sumac, author of You Are Enough, Love Poems for the End of the World. So that'll be next Saturday as well, from 10 to 12, brought to you by the Columbia Valley Pride and, and Invermere Public Library. Will that be at the library? Probably, yeah. Good. We've been reading through the 94 calls to action from the Truth and Reconciliation Commission. Today we read call number 62 under the category Education for Reconciliation. We call upon the federal, provincial, and territorial governments in consultation and collaboration with survivors, Aboriginal peoples, and educators to, number, number one, make age-appropriate curriculum on residential schools, treaties, and Aboriginal peoples' historical and contemporary contributions to Canada, a mandatory education requirement for kindergarten to grade 12 students. Provide the necessary funding to post-secondary institutions to educate teachers on how to integrate Indigenous knowledge and teaching methods into classrooms. Number three, provide the necessary funding to Aboriginal schools to utilize Indigenous knowledge and teaching methods in classrooms. And number four, establish senior level positions in government at the assistant deputy minister level or hired or higher dedicated uh, to Aboriginal content in education. So wonderful to be reading through that. And we acknowledge that we are on land wherever we are that was occupied for many years and is still occupied. And uh, we wanna be mindful of the history and how that, how we are here now and uh, thoughtful about topics like ownership or just sharing and, and occupying and living in right relations. And so here in the Columbia Valley, we have the Shuswap and Tanaha people and the chosen homeland of the Métis. And I invite us. That's a beautiful picture of a, of a building in the background and the trees and the spaciousness that's there. Uh, but a moment of presence is a moment where we step out of our mind and out of our thinking, where we live a lot of the time, and we step into the present moment with our awareness. Today is the second Sunday after Pentecost. We look at stories in the Bible today of how people were expanded in their understanding of who and what God is and of who God cares about and who people are invited to care about. 
Paul says a radical thing when he says that all a person needs is faith and to trust grace. Jesus does a radical thing when he welcomes tax collectors and sinners and when he commends a woman who is thought of as impure for reaching out and touching him and when he touches a dead girl and restores her to life. May we be open to letting the message in the stories further expand us today. And our opening hymn is Come In, Come In and Sit Down. It's number 395 in Voices United. You can stand or sit, uh, whatever you like. And our friends up in uh, Golden are leading us in music today. Thank you for doing that. To make it difficult in church anyway so uh, i think we made it through that so you can have a seat I invite you to have a seat and i'd like to read our words of wisdom today it's a little story uh, called streaky people from the song of the bird by anthony de a preacher <laughs> a preacher put this question to a class of children if all the good people were white and all the bad people were black, what color would you be? Little Mary Jane replied, Reverend, I'd be streaky. So would the preacher, so would the Mahatmas, popes, and saints. A man was looking for a good church to attend, and he happened to enter one in which the congregation and the preacher were reading from their prayer book. They were saying, we have left undone those things which we ought to have done, and we have done those things which we ought not to have done. 
The man dropped into a seat and sighed with relief as he said to himself, thank goodness I found my crowd at last. Attempts to hide your streakiness will sometimes be successful, always dishonest. All right, if it's the theme of today's service, uh, the theme very much of the gospel reading today. Okay, so there's a picture of Benny. So I'm going to go and see if Benny's showing up to church today. Yeah, I'm showing up. Because I'm excited. It's been so long. I hope today's show and tell. I've got something I want to show you. Cool, um, I got something too. Oh, good. A, I, lot, a lot of people have these. Oh, what do you have? Well, wow, this, what is that? This morning I went to Lockhart Park. Yeah? And we went outside, and this, this poor balloon. Oh, hi. Uh -huh. On the road. Yeah. And I think he's going to go away from someone's party. Huh. So he went way up into the sky, and then it came down. In front of our Very cool. Our he, it probably's got that helium stuff in it, right? Like the second element on the periodic table. Man, you're a smart dude. If I, do you think there's any left? Like if you gave it to me, and then I swallowed it, like my voice would go like, oh, funny. <laughs> Maybe. <laughs> Benny, uh, I hate to say it, but your voice is already a little funny. But anyway, huh? we, but we, no, it's perfect. It's perfect. Thank you. you. Hey, you've got something to show yeah, you. Yeah, is that? Yeah. I see a whole bunch of people wearing rainbows lately, and I love rainbows. Uh, you know, thanks for bringing us to church today. Yeah. Um, I, I think the rainbow is such a, a lovely representation of how life has diversity to it. Because yeah. uh, there's so much, I guess, the whole spectrum of colors in a rainbow. Is right. about, it's about diversity. Yes. And, uh, and then there's a, a word that Kate has helped us learn, um, diverse abilities. Yeah, that's a neat one. And it's about the same thing. Well, that's right. Yeah. And, and about how life has diversity. And um, have you ever, have you noticed, Benny, because you're out in the wilderness a lot. Yeah. There's diversity in the wilderness. Oh, my goodness, yes. Uh, you know, and Big animals, little animals, big yeah. trees, little trees. And, and bugs. Annoying bugs. annoying bugs. There's these mosquitoes, bug bears. You're lucky as humans because mosquitoes are all all over bears. <laughs> well, they're all over humans too. Oh. But we've invented these things called houses and screens and stuff. Yeah. But yeah. Mosquitoes are. Uh, well, I guess they're just doing their job. Hey. Yeah. They're doing their job. Yeah. They they're part of the diverse. Yeah, but we just don't know why we need them, eh? Yeah. And you know the opposite of. Um, diversity, I think, well, it, we could think of it as uniformity. Have you ever heard that word before? Uniform? When everything is the same? Yeah. Yeah. And, and sometimes I think, I don't know about bears, but I think sometimes people like things when they're uniform, especially when everybody's like them. <laughs> yeah, then you feel like, okay, I know how things work and I'm safe yeah. as long as everybody does it the way I do, right? Yeah. I know. Yeah. And and so we're talking about that in church today because oh. because back in the time of Jesus, um, there were yeah. people who wanted this uniformity. Actually, they had another word for it. They, they called it purity. Oh. Yeah. And so we're talking about purity, which is kind of like uniformity right. and yeah. and so on. But Jesus wasn't. He challenged people's attitudes about purity back then because they weren't kind. And, yeah. and they represented a God that Jesus, for, for Jesus, God was compassionate yeah. and, and not pure. And I think when people think that life can be pure, usually somebody gets hurt. Yeah. Maybe God was purely compassionate. <laughs> I like that. That's right. Yeah. And so, like, it's an interesting journey that we go on as humans sort of like going just a kind of a recognition that life has diversity in it, it. it's an interesting thing i think of what's tricky in human for, for you humans because you like competition you like things better than others hmm. and and there's something fun about that and okay yeah 
But it's tricky to make sure you don't start thinking people really are better than someone else. Well, that's, yeah. Yeah. That's, that, yeah, you've gone, like, that's very yeah. true. Because not only do we think that everybody should be like me, but I'm better than everybody. And, that's where yeah. the problem comes. Yeah. I bet. I bet. So we celebrate diversity in life. Yeah. Because it just is. So when I see this rainbow, I can think of celebrating diversity. Absolutely. Yeah. You know, I heard a story. Me too. Uh, <laughs> Maybe it's the same story. Well, there was a there was a man in a community, and and the 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 different there was different Christians, and they were fighting with each other who oh. was better and all that. Really? And, and an indigenous elder said, "Well, look up onto that hill, and do you see all those trees?" And yeah. he said, "Yeah." And he says, "Are they different?" And he said, "Yeah, there's different trees." And he says, "Well, they get along. Why can't you?" <laughs> ah, that's the good one. <laughs> yeah. That's not the story I'd heard. Oh. Okay. Yeah. Well, see. Well, well, I'll tell mine another time. Okay. Yeah. Hey, thanks for showing up to church today yeah. and bringing the rainbow. Thank you for That's letting wonderful. me visit. Okay. Yeah. Lovely. Okay. You add diversity to our congregation. I do. <laughs> I'm like the only bear. Yeah. 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 Okay. Bring your friends. Yeah. Okay. Well, we'll do. Yeah. <laughs> bye bye. Okay, buddy. Wonderful, everybody. So back to our, oh, we get to sing a wonderful hymn now. It's uh, the words and message of this hymn are so, so great. Let us build a house. It's number one in more voices. Stand and sit uh, however you'd like to. And thank you, folks in Golden, for leading us.
Oh, beautiful. Thanks, everybody. And thanks, uh, folks in Golden. Sounds really good. And Judy's going to come forward and read our, our scripture today. Morning, Judy. The first reading is Romans 4, 13 to 25. In today's reading from Romans, Paul talks about the promise God made to Abraham and Sarah. Abraham believed and hoped, even when there was no reason for hoping. It was Abraham and Sarah's choice to believe in God's promises, hoping against hope. That made them the spiritual ancestors of all those who choose by faith to follow the urging of God within, even when it seems foolish and contradictory to social or religious convention. Making hopeful choices in the midst of what might appear to be insurmountable odds is a mark of the covenant community. It was to this spiritual heritage of Abraham and Sarah that Paul appealed when he argued that Gentiles should be received into the community of believers without having to be circumcised. It is in the light of this same spiritual heritage of faithfulness, rather than adherence to the law, that Paul reminds his readers of the effects of Jesus' death and resurrection. The resurrection is God's faithful response to Jesus' act of faithfulness. From Romans 4. For the promise that he would inherit the world did not come to Abraham or to his descendants through the law, but through the righteousness of faith. It is the adherents of the law who are to be the heirs. Faith is null and the promise is void. For the law brings wrath, but where there is no law, neither is there violation. For this reason it depends on faith, in order that the promise may rest on grace and be guaranteed to all his descendants, not only to the adherents of the law, but also to those who share the faith of Abraham. For he is the father of all of us, as it is written, I have made you the father of many nations. In the presence of God, in whom he believed, who gives life to the dead and calls into existence the things that do not exist, hoping against hope, he believed that he would become the father of many nations, according to what was said, so numerous shall your descendants be. He did not weaken in faith when he considered his own body, which was already as good as dead, for he was about a hundred years old, or when he considered the barrenness of Sarah's, Sarah's womb, no distrust made him waver concerning the promise of God, but he grew strong in his faith, as he gave glory to God, being fully convinced that God was able to do what he had promised. Therefore his faith was reckoned to him as righteousness. Now the words, it was reckoned to him, were written not for his sake alone, but for ours also. It will be reckoned to us who believe in him who raised Jesus our Lord from the dead, who was handed over to the death for our trespasses, and was raised for our justification. The Gospel reading is from Matthew 9. What is striking in the following passage is the inclusivity of Jesus' presence and movement. Why did tax collectors and sinners want to be in Jesus' presence? What attracted them? How radical was it for them to feel included in the fellowship? The Pharisees were a relatively new sect of Judaism that wanted to enforce the purity laws, which separated people from clean and unclean, holy and unholy. In so many ways in this passage, Jesus challenges the purity laws of his time and uplifts qualities more essential than purity and separation. If it is your tradition to stand for the gospel reading, please feel free to stand. From Matthew 9. As Jesus was walking along, he saw a man called Matthew sitting at the tax booth, and he said to him, follow me. And he got up and followed him. And as he sat at dinner in the house, many tax collectors and sinners came and were sitting with him and his disciples. 
When the Pharisees saw this, they said to his disciples, Why does your teacher eat with tax collectors and sinners? But when he heard this, he said, Those who are well have no need of a physician, but those who are sick, go and learn what that means. I deserve mercy, not sacrifice, for I have come to call not the righteous, but sinners. While he was saying these things to them, suddenly a leader of the synagogue came in and knelt before him, saying, My daughter has just died, but come and lay your hand on her, and she will live. Jesus got up and followed him with his disciples. Then suddenly a woman who had been suffering from hemorrhages for 12 years came up behind him and touched the fringe of his cloak. For she said to herself, If I only touch his cloak, I will be made well. Jesus turned, and seeing her, he said, Take heart, daughter, your faith has made you well. And instantly the woman was made well. When Jesus came to the leader's house and saw the flute players and the crowd making a commotion, he said, Go away, for the girl is not dead, but sleeping. And they laughed at him. But when the crowd had been put outside, he went in and took her by the hand, and the girl got up. And the report of this spread throughout that district. May we hear sacred wisdom through these human texts. Thanks be to God. Amen. <clears throat> hmm. Hey everybody, um, here we go. This is a um, <clears throat> such a rich passage to talk about and such an important topic. I, I, I don't need to say this, but I sometimes wonder how people who are tax collectors today, I, in Canada, I'm assuming, who live in Ottawa or Victoria, or, they go, well, this is, this is a challenging passage for tax collectors. They're the bad people in, in the society back then. Maybe they still feel like people don't love tax collectors today. But so much about this, this reading is just so rich about how Jesus called Matthew, a tax collector, to come and be one of his inner disciples. And just when you just even pause on that and you think, what would the people back then have thought that Jesus calls a tax collector to be one of his closest disciples? Because they must have thought, are you kidding me? Like, why a tax collector? And then it says that when he, Jesus was inside and dining, the tax collectors and sinners gathered with him. And uh, that just jumps out for me because I, I'm thinking like, what was it about Jesus that those tax collectors and sinners, it's quite the labels, eh? And in many ways, they were labels and they stood for people who were outside and on the margins. So maybe today we'd come up with different words to describe who's on the outside and the margins. Who do we not like? That's who's sitting with Jesus. And I'm thinking, yeah, that's not the kind of ministry if I had. I've had... Usually people who are on the outside don't really want to hang out with me. I hang out with people on the inside. Something was going on with Jesus that they were there. And then the Pharisees, it doesn't say they grumbled, but Pharisees do a lot of grumbling in the Gospels. And they grumble that Jesus is hanging out with these tax collectors and sinners because they're not pure. They're not holy. They're not Jewish, they're, they're Gentiles, and they're sinners even. And the Pharisees was a new party that started to care about the purity laws, just kind of like the Essenes. I don't know if you've heard that word, the Essenes, but the Essenes removed themselves from society, and they went down to the Dead Sea, and they went into caves. They just wanted to get away from the rest of sinful society and get things pure again. But the Pharisees sort of stayed in society, but they wanted to change everybody back to these purity laws. But they're not kind. They're not loving people, like not in the story anyway. So then 
Jesus leaves that house, uh, the leader of the synagogue, which is so interesting why it's a leader of the synagogue, comes and says, my daughter has died, but if you come and touch her, she will live. What, like, it's beautiful that this, this representative of Judaism in that community comes and asks Jesus for help. So off they go. It's like Jesus says, yeah, let's go. Off they go, and they're walking across the streets in Capernaum, and I can just imagine the crowd bouncing around, and people are there, and and some people would have said, oh, he's a holy man. We have a holy man in our midst. But then there's this woman who has had a hemorrhage for 12 years. And in Jewish society, and almost certainly this was a, she was menstruating, it was a menstrual flow. Even if it wasn't, any kind of bodily fluid that's leaving your body makes you unclean. Um, and anything you touch becomes unclean. So this poor woman who's had a flow of blood for 12 years, she has been an unclean person in that community and anything she touches becomes unclean. Can you imagine what she's gone through? And can you imagine the courage or the something, the last resortness that she had to say, I'm gonna touch that holy man. <laughs> Brings me to tears when I think of it. Like, I don't know if she had a hoodie or a shawl and she must have pulled it over her head, thinking if she just sort of mixes herself into the crowd and no one will see her, and if she can just touch him, maybe she'll get better, and then she can slink off into the shadows where she's been the last 12 years. And so she reaches out and touches the hem of his garment, and she feels something change in her. But then, worst of all, this holy man turns around and says, who touched me? And she has to say, I did. And he says, though, daughter, your faith has made you well. Go in peace. Which is indicative that the people who really needed healing wasn't her, it was the community. They needed to hear, they needed, she needed Jesus to say in front of all of them that she is a person of faith and that, like, and that she is well because maybe they would have kept bringing their sick attitudes towards her and helped her not be well. But instead of Jesus being worried that this impure woman touched him and made him impure, not at all. He's not a holy man, he's a compassionate man. And then he carries on to the, the ruler's house, comes in and I know there's more details to the story, but just the part that he touches the body of a dead body. And there's more to the story because in other gospels, it makes the point that this girl is 12 years old, the age of menstruation, the age of becoming a woman. It's like there's, there's a strong message in this about women, that you, women are dying becoming women, or they're dying being women. And Jesus touches her, and is not afraid of being impure, and she lives, and she's well. So the overall context or, or message of this, these stories is it's a very common theme in the, in the story of Jesus. The Jesus challenges the purity laws of his time. Can I just say, it's, there's other words we could use, the purity culture, the purity system, the purity mentality, and the purity laws of the time. So I'd like us today to be thinking about this purity, purity laws. Why do we have purity laws? And, and you might think you don't have any purity laws. <laughs> I'm going to challenge you a little bit because I just wonder if we as a human beings, we border on having certain things that are almost like purity laws, purity mentality, purity thinking in our lives. I, I'm a, a type one on the Enneagram, which is a perfectionist. And I like things kind of, you know, right. You know, the, the saying, everything's, everything in its, everything has a place. And every, what's the saying? Everything in its place, everything. Say it louder, Wendy. A place for everything and everything in its place. Anybody thought that line before? <laughs> it's a bit of a 
purity principle. Everything, and one of the maybe the, the human things about purity is it's a way that we get some kind of order in chaos. So the Jewish people, when they come out of slavery and domination and they establish themselves and they created all these laws. And I've read before that they were almost one of the first peoples to create an ordered society of laws. They had lived in chaos. And to, to create laws is like ordering chaos. Have you heard any communication coming out of America these days? People are saying we need to be a country of laws. If we're not a country of laws, what are we? And we need presidents who are adhering to laws. Um, it's vital to who we are. So there may be something about purity laws, order, so on, that makes sense for us. We have them a little bit. Like you, when we have lunch, we're not going to go into the bathroom. You'd go, no, you don't do that. We have food, food safe persons who handle food safely. There's sort of like a purity part of that. And you, you, we get that. And we have, we have other things like that. If I reflect on purity laws, can I just say, maybe there's a point where it's about respect. And so if you come into church, you might say, well, there's a certain way to act and be in church that's respectful of the place. Okay. And I get that. I remember struggling one time or more than one time uh, when I had wedding rehearsals. And the groomsmen would all come in <clears throat> wearing their greasy old ball caps. And it was kind of my issue. And I really struggled. Is this my issue about these guys wearing their ball caps in the sanctuary? Should I ask them to take them off? If I do, is this just one more little, little message from religion that they're not good enough? And so I, Brent, just leave it alone. Let them wear their ball caps during the rehearsal. It's, it's my purity thing. It's not their purity thing. But can you sort of see the struggle? That, we go, that goes on. That goes on on a golf course. You need to wear a certain attire on a golf course. Why? I don't, you can answer that question for yourself. I'm assuming if you go into the House of Commons in Ottawa, there's a certain decorum, way to act, even what to wear. And I, I think this is a part of it when, when the crowds went into the uh, House of Representatives on January 6th, and people put their feet up on desks, or they pooped, or they brought in the Confederate flag. At some point, it's not appropriate. It's, there's something about desecrating what some people thought was sacred space, even though that's a kind of a political sacred space. But you see, there's, we do a little dance around purity that way. But then there's something that happens where purity gets more problematic. And in the Bible, one of the descriptions of God is God is holy. So when you read Leviticus, which Leviticus has so many of the purity laws, it says, you shall be holy as God is holy. Now the word holy Unfortunately, I mean, I, I think you can broaden the word, but it, it, it kind of by definition, it means separate. So when it says you shall be holy as God is holy, it's like you shall be separate as God is separate. And so people hear that, that we need to separate out from the unholy, from the, from the unclean, from the impure. And we need to be pure and and clean ourselves. Okay. Uh, and maybe that's even when people put their desks up on their feet up on Nancy Pelosi's desk at the, in the House of Representatives, people would say, that's just desecrating, you know, it's just not what we do here. And, and then things could happen in church that we just, it's just not appropriate. This is a holy place. So you, you don't put your coffee mug on the Bible or something like that people could say. But there's a, a next level to it, and that, I'll just put this in there, that always in spirituality, for me, one of the questions is, is where is the ego in on anything? And the ego in all of us 
likes to be separate and superior. When you look at people's egos, and you can look at it yourself, where in life do you like to be separate and superior? But then, of course, we can have a collective ego. So when we say things like, my country is the greatest country in the world, you're kind of going, why do you need to say that? Where is that coming from? Is that the collective ego that says you're the greatest country in the world? And so on. And then, and then, so this is like some of my reflections on purity. Purity, every culture and every religion has a purity aspect to it, a purity culture within the religion or within the culture. So it can be a religious thing, it, it, but it's not only a religious thing. So when you think of the Aryan race mentality of Nazi Germany, that's a purity culture, a racial purity culture in Nazi Germany. It was very sick and very, um, yeah, very problematic and not a religious thing. So a good question to ask is, where are, where, where are there signs where there is a non-religious purity mentality in society? I was talking to a man about a week ago and he said, he's from Alberta, and he said, when you're from Alberta, almost by definition, you need to be against the carbon tax. If you're not against the carbon tax, you're not an Albertan. That's what he said. <laughs> Do you hear a purity mentality in that? There's, there's definitely, there's more we could talk about because, uh, you know, there's a dichotomy going on and there's the right and the left and, and there's book banning and then there's, People saying this speech is not appropriate. There's a political correctness. On both sides, you could say there's this purity mentality. This is correct. This is not. Don't talk this way. Don't read these books. That kind of stuff. But there is a purity culture in religion too. So where I'm going with this, and where I think it, it matters so much, is... As you know, in the United States, there's a movement, movements that are anti-immigration, anti-LGBTQ+, and anti-abortion, uh, and other movements that I think it could be seen and argued that there's a certain purity mentality that's driving those anti-immigration. We, we shouldn't have people, um, oh, you know, what is it that Tucker Carlson was promoting? The great, oh, I'm forgetting the title, but it was almost, it was, it was along, there's this th th idea that started in France, but it is, if we let too many immigrants in, we'll no longer be American. It will dilute our Americanism. I don't know if it was great exceptionalism. Um, but there's a purity sort of attitude to that, hey? And then people can say, well, we shouldn't have queers. I've learned that queer in the, in the LGBT community, can, they can use it in a positive way. They're just saying, we're, we're queer, but we celebrate that because that, that's just who we are. But people would say, well, that's not pure. And then, of course, in abortion, with abortion, uh, it, it could well be that anti-abortion people are saying everybody should be chaste and they shouldn't have sex until marriage and and they should make the right choices and so we should have purity when it comes to our sexual choices so a purity mentality that may be behind some of these movements and that's why it's interesting i think for us to reflect on today in this gospel passage that Jesus, again, it's a very common theme. He challenges the purity laws, the purity mentality, the purity culture, and the purity system of his time. The word system is interesting because in that religious system, when people were impure, they needed often to go to the temple and they needed to buy an animal. Or like when, Mary, when Jesus was born, Mary and Joseph went to the temple and they bought two turtle doves to have them sacrificed in order for them to be ritually clean. The system starts, it's an interesting one, who benefits from the system? 
and who pays the cost in the system. And so when Jesus, there's this common message in the Gospels that he challenges the purity laws and the purity culture, the purity system. And he says, it, the, it's not about purity, it's about compassion. And so what's interesting, it comes down to the question, what is the character of your God? And if you're, the character of your God is that God is holy and God is separate, that leads more to then you need to be pure. Or at least thinking that you're pure. I, I, I think that's a beautiful little story, you know, about we're all streaky. <laughs> and that's the trouble with people who think they're pure. It's like, well, if you were honest, you might see that you're a streaky person too. But I just have to remember where I was here. But when Jesus challenges them in, in, this, in this, oh yeah, back to this thing about what the character of your God, is your God wholly separate, which then leads you to think, I need to be pure, we need to be pure. That, that's an outcome of that image of God. But I think this is what Jesus says, the character of God is compassion. And if the character of your God is compassion, that leads you then to being a compassionate person in this world. And what's interesting, you'll all know the line in the Gospels, be ye perfect as your heavenly Father is perfect. And then sometimes that word is translated, be ye holy as your heavenly Father is holy. But in the Gospel of Luke, Luke changes it and says, be ye compassionate as God is compassionate. So you, see, you hear the tension going on right in those two Gospels. Matthew says, be ye perfect or holy. And Luke says, be ye compassionate or sometimes translated merciful as God is compassionate and merciful. So it's a significant different way of being in this world. So I don't know if this is a helpful message for you today to look for us to look at purity where is there purity in our own life? When, when is it sort of like, is it helpful? Is it, is it helpful to some degree, natural to some degree? Uh, although the word purity seems to be just problematic right off the get-go. Uh, going back to the thing like, no, we're all streaky people. <laughs> um, so maybe purity right off the, the get-go is just problematic. And then to, to take a look, where is it in society? Where is it in Canada? Where is that purity mentality seeping in Canada that we all have to be a certain uniform way that some people think we need to be? Because it's there. And, uh, and as we strive to follow in the way of Jesus, then we have a choice. Is it about being perfect and pure or is it about being compassionate? And, and I think it's pretty clear, actually, what the message of Jesus is. Thanks for listening, and thanks be to God. Amen. Come touch our hearts. It's number 12 and more voices. And let's enjoy this beautiful hymn at this time.
Thanks, everybody. Beautiful. A beautiful hymn. And uh, Karen, thank you for leading us in our prayers today. Friends, are you okay if I lead us in prayer today? <laughs> Let's just have a, a time of prayer. We, um, we open ourselves up to the more of life, quiet our minds, to be aware of the stillness and spaciousness that is around us and within us. Prayer would be communing and connecting to that source of life that we call God in whom we live and move and have our being. Seeking to get out of the way so that we can be a vessel, so that we can be open, so that we can be in touch with that which is greater than ourselves. And there may be things, well, there are so many things of our lives for which we are grateful. And when we count our blessings, when we look for the beauty and the goodness of life, we are paying attention. And we, it's so good to pay attention. And it's also okay to bring our, our streakiness, our needs, our hurts to God, our places that, where we are estranged, where we are hurting, where we want to reach out and touch, where we need help, where we may be feeling dead, and want new life to come. To touch those places of wellness, to feel and know wellness within us, no matter what's happening on the surface of our bodies or where our often busy minds are, Always, beneath it all, is peace and sanity and wellness. May we know that place.
and we do think of others in our prayer times. The, the faces, the names of people may come to mind in their various life situations. We remember them in love and we remember that they have wellness within them as well. May they know it. And we pray for the wide human family. There's just such a diversity in the human family. And there'll be people who are doing better than others. There'll be situations that are more safe and life-giving than others. We remember the various situations that are happening around the world. And continue to seek to commune and connect to you, O God, in a time of further silence. May we know how to lose ourselves in you, that we may truly find ourselves in you. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Our closing hymn, we'll sing it through twice because it's just kind of one verse and it's beautiful. We sang it the last couple of, well, times that we've been together. Spirit of Life, 381 in Voices United. Our benediction today comes from Brian McLaren in his book, Faith After Doubt. May God bless you, keep you, be gracious to you. May God give you grace never to sell yourself 
or God, short. Grace to risk something big for something good. Grace to remember that the world is now too dangerous for anything but truth and too small for anything but love. So may God take your mind and think through it. May God take your lips and speak through them. May God take your hands and do good with them. May God take your heart and set it on fire. Amen.